So now we're starting with the next session. We're just introducing ourselves for you. My name is Gabi Böhl. I'm head of the uh, department risk communication here at the BFR. Uh, good morning. My name is Tobin Robinson. I work for the European Food Safety Authority, where I'm head of the Scientific Committee and Emerging Risks Unit. Thank you. So without further ado, we go into the second session of this morning, Accounting for Uncertainty in Decision Making. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker, Granger Morgan. Really needs no introduction, I think, for anybody working in the area of uncertainty. Uh, professor Morgan holds the rank of uh, Hammerschlag University Professor of Engineering at the Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, he is uh, currently uh, founding department head of the Department of Engineering and Public Policy, a position that he's held for 38 years now, and has worked extensively on issues related to characterization and treatment of uncertainty in quantitative policy analysis. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I've met some people I didn't know before and learned quite a bit. Um, I should start by saying that essentially all decisions we make are made in the presence of significant uncertainty. That's true for our personal lives. It's true for companies and organizations. It's true as nations. I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk first, I'm going to discuss prescriptive analytical strategies that suggest how people ought to make decisions in the face of uncertainty. And then I'm going to discuss how people actually frame and make decisions in the face of uncertainty. Now, last night I decided to rip this talk apart and put it back together in light of a number of things that I had heard over the course of the last day and a half. And so the last one or two items on here may uh, have to get ditched depending upon how the time runs. Uh, and as I go through these, I'm going to briefly mention some of the relevant literatures. Uh, I should start by mentioning that if I'm going to make decisions, I have to have decision rules. Uh, they could be as simple as binary or threshold, safe, unsafe, regulate, don't regulate. And uh, many of the risks we've been talking about in this meeting, I think decisions get made in that sort of context. In the U.S., in addition to chemical risk assessment, we have the example of the Clean Air Act, which adopts a rights-based formulation, which basically says choose a level that protects the most sensitive population. No trade-offs, it's, it's rights-based. On the other hand, there are also strategies that involve balancing, things like benefit cost, maximizing expected net benefits, and so on. And again, to use a U.S. example, many of the U.S federal water quality rules are not rights-based. They call for a balance between water quality and the control costs associated with achieving them. And then there are a whole bunch of other uh, decision rules that one might adopt, such as uh, minimizing the chance of worst outcomes and so on. Uh, it turns out that most of the classic literature on decision-making focuses on maximizing expected net benefits and so that's what I'm going to principally talk about for the next couple of minutes, beginning with the idea of benefit cost analysis. Now, suppose I got a couple of options and I need to choose between them. What strategy should I adopt in choosing? And I could choose, uh, you know, the one that's most energy efficient, uh, the one that uh, is favored by the U.S. Office of Management and Budget, budget the simplest, <coughs> the cheapest. Benefit cost analysis basically says I should add up all the benefits, I should add up all the costs, take the difference, and choose the one that has the largest uh, uh, net benefits. And that sounds pretty simple, but the details of how to actually perform that analysis, how to assess those benefits and costs, get very complicated. I'll just give you one example. I mean, in, on the benefit side, typically, Economists argue that the way to assess benefits is by assessing something called the consumer surplus, that is the amount of er the area above the, uh, uh, <coughs> the demand curve and above the, the market price. And there are similar complications all across this field. Uh, here's a, an example of a benefit cost analysis developed quite a few years ago on controlling emissions from motor vehicles done by my uh, now deceased colleague Lester Lave and some of his colleagues. Uh, 
And so these sorts of strategies do get used fairly regularly in setting standards in the environmental area. And while there's no particular reason that benefit-cost analysis can't incorporate uncertainty, as it's been practiced, there's been little or no characterization or analysis of uncertainty in most benefit-cost analyses. To go back to my former colleague, Lester, if you ever are looking for a really good critique of benefit-cost analysis, this piece that Lester did, uh, Do the Benefits Exceed the Costs, uh, he concludes yes, but he has a whole lot of, of caveats, is a really wonderful piece that, that you might find useful. In fact, uh, the fact that there is uncertainty, of course, shouldn't mean that uh, we don't take action. Indeed, the consequences of doing nothing often carry comparable or larger uncertainties than taking action, and there's a big literature on, on these uh, 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 strategies for making decisions in the face of uncertainty. Uh, I've uh, shown books here by Howard Rafa and his colleague Schlafer, who are one of the two main peop uh, and groups that developed uh, uh, decision analysis. Uh, the middle two are, are from Ron Howard and his colleagues at Stanford. And then there are a bunch of others, like Maury de Groot, who was on the faculty of the statistics department in my university. And as I said, these methods are now widely termed decision analysis. And the basic idea here is that I, uh, I choose a bunch of, or I, I identify a set of choices with outcomes X. And for each choice, I use all available current knowledge, uh, call it C, to assess the probability that each of those outcomes will occur, and we'll call that the probability of X given C. In other words, decision analysis is inherently a Bayesian formulation of uncertainty. And then I decide, uh, to decide, I have to somehow value each of those outcomes, so I construct a utility function, call it U of X, over each of the outcomes. And then to make the choice, I choose that outcome which maximizes my expected utility. And rather than deal with continuous functions, which of course you could do, uh, decision analysis typically discretizes everything, and so you get things called decision trees. I'm not going to take time to go through all of the complications. It turns out that, that decision analysis is based on a set of fairly uh, standard axioms, and if you follow the, the basic strategies of decision analysis, you can be confident that the conclusions you reach will comply with those axioms, and there's all sorts of complicating issues like using these methods to uh, assess the value of perfect and imperfect information and, and similar sorts of things. But to do a decision analysis, I need to know a decision maker's preferences. And a lot of economists seem to assume that we all walk around with fully articulated utility functions in our heads. Uh, but psychologists and decision analysts believe that people often need help in figuring out those pre uh, preferences. Uh, here's a lovely formulation in a paper uh, that Barak Fishoff wrote some years ago called something like value functions, or value, is there anything in there? <coughs> And, and this continuum at the bottom ranges between people who know what they want and who have well-articulated values. So for example, I prefer uh, a certain kind of candy bar to another kind. Uh, to, and on the other end, people who lack articulated values on specific topics but do have fundamental values. And so for example, if you ask me to value pristine lakes in northern Ontario, I may have difficulty. But, on the other hand, with some help, I might be able to develop a utility function. And folks like Ralph Keeney, a well-known decision analyst, have written entire books on how to help people work from their uh, basic values to develop articulated utility functions. Uh, here's a simple taxonomy. So I've talked about benefit-cost analysis, which is usually a, to evaluate just a single option. Decision analysis typically involves choosing between options and inherently deals with uncertainty. And then uh, in both of those cases, it's normal to use a single uh, uh, metric of, uh, of outcome, usually dollars, but not necessarily. I mean, decision analysis is often worked out in terms of utility and then worked backwards. Uh, but multi-attribute utility theory and multi-objective methods uh, 
uh, allow the decision maker to treat multiple, uh, uh, obje to, mul to, to not combine everything into a single dollar metric. Uh, and dealing with multiple objectives is something that uh, Keeney and Rafa have written about extensively. My colleague Jerry Cohn at Carnegie Mellon uh, has uh, a lovely book on multi-objective programming and planning. Now, there's one other strategy I want to mention, uh, and that is the use of real options. Suppose I'm going to build a building, for example, and I know how much concrete and rebar I got to put in the foundation, but I decide maybe I want to preserve the option of adding additional stories later on. So I put more concrete and rebar in the foundation. I buy an option for the future. And so that's another strategy for dealing with uncertainty in decision making. And then the last thing before I shift gears and start talking about how people actually make decisions is a topic that we haven't talked about in this meeting, but I think deserves much more attention, and that's the notion of using order of magnitude methods to bound problems. Uh, so the piece on the left there, I mean, it came with lovely artwork when it originally uh, appeared, but I couldn't find it, uh, is a piece that I wrote for uh, 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 environmental science and technology called The Neglected Art of Bounding Analysis. And then here are several papers I've done with colleagues that involved using bounding analysis. The problem is it's really hard to get these things published because, I mean, take the one here on the bottom right, bounding U.S. electricity demand in 2020, 2050. Reviewers want all sorts of elaborate probabilistic stuff. And you, and you argue, it's baloney. I mean, trying to estimate, you know, the best I can do is go through a set of bounding arguments. And it's really, I mean, so there is a bias in the field against using simple order of magnitude methods to do bounding. But in many of the problems we've been talking about, I think there's a lot to be said for uh, simple strategies like that. All right, so now I want to discuss how people actually frame and make decisions. Incidentally, uh, find a pencil and something to write with, because in a minute I'm going to ask you to write down a few numbers. And as I said, I ripped these slides apart and put them back together last night in order to be responsive to some of the things that I've been hearing in this meeting. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure how the time is going to run, so I may have to throw out the last uh, uh, a few slides. We'll wait and see. Okay, there's a large literature based on empirical studies that describes how people actually make judgments in the face of uncertainty. And I would guess everybody in this room has probably read uh, at least some of these papers by Kahneman, Tversky, Slovic, Fishoff, and Lichtenstein. They are sort of classics now in this field. If you don't know any of this literature, I urge you to go find a bit. Uh, uh, for example, uh, you can find a couple of really nice summary pieces in the journal Science. Uh, I want to talk about just two cognitive heuristics. The first, availability. When we make judgments about the probability of something occurring, the probability judgment is usually driven by how easily we can think of previous occurrences of the event or imagine such occurrences. And the sort of classic illustration of this is a study that Lichtenstein et al. did years ago in which they told uh, respondents there are 50,000 deaths a year from motor vehicles. Tell me how many deaths you think there may be from all these other causes. So in this plot along the horizontal axis is the actual number of deaths, and in the vertical axis is the assessed number of deaths. And you can see there's scale compression. People underestimate the frequency of common events. They overestimate the frequency of rare events. But notice stroke up there in the upper right and botulism down at the lower left. These results are highly repetitive. You can replicate these and you see exactly the same thing. And those deltas are the result of availability. Why? Well, lots and lots of people die from stroke. But I don't hear about it except, you know, if it's a famous person or a, or a good friend or a family member. And so I have trouble imagining or thinking up past occurrences. Similarly, botulism is above the curve because any time anybody in the world dies from botulism, I probably read about it in the news. Uh, so now I want to describe a second uh, heuristic called anchoring and adjustment. Suppose that rather than telling you or people that 50,000 deaths a year from motor vehicles, actually the number's a bit lower now in the US, uh, 
The, instead, I, I tell you, a thousand deaths a year from uh, electrocutions. I note the arrows, arrows are off a little bit there, but the, lower, the whole curve shifts down. Why? Because I have given people this lower anchor, and anchoring adjustment heuristic says the probability judgment is frequently driven by the starting point, which then becomes an anchor. Uh, and that can be true even if the anchor has absolutely nothing to do with the task uh, that I've been asked to uh, complete. Now, as Scott noted yesterday, brain science is beginning to figure out where in the brain some of these relevant processes occur, and uh, that's really neat stuff, and I look forward to learning more about it. The next thing I want to talk about is overconfidence, and I've gotten you to all get a pencil out and, and some uh, paper. Now I want you to write down uh, three numbers. I'm going to name four canals, and I'd like you to each one, first, estimate how long this canal is. Then, give me a 1% lower bound. That is, there's only one chance in 100 it could be shorter, and only one chance in 100 that it could be longer. All right, everybody? All right, so the first one is the Kiel Canal, which is, goes between the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. So three numbers, best estimate, lower confidence value, upper confidence value. The second one is the Suez Canal, which goes, of course, between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. Best estimate, lower value, upper value. The Panama Canal, which, of course, goes between the Caribbean and the Pacific. Best estimate, lower bound, upper bound. And finally, the Cape Cod Canal. Some of you probably don't know about the Cape Cod Canal, but if I'm taking a boat from Boston to, to New York, I don't want to have to go way out around Cape Cod, so this is a canal that cuts off the base. All right, so people are going to be, first of all, I've told you what the subject here is, so maybe you're already going <laughs> to, you're informed, but I'm going to give you the lengths, and I'd like a show of hands uh, of how many uh, put an, produced an interval that doesn't include the actual length. The Kiel Canal is 95 kilometers long. Uh, any hands? Anybody produce? Yes, okay, a few. Uh, the Suez Canal is 193 kilometers long. Anybody? Yeah, I've got some hands for that as well. The Panama Canal is 82 kilometers long. Yes, I got hands there. And the Cape Cod Canal is 11 kilometers long. Anybody got hands there? One or two. Okay. This is a standard problem. We are all systematically overconfident. So this uh, plot here in the upper left is from a set of, um, um, of studies where literally thousands of respondents have participated in questions of the sort that I just asked. And you can see 20, 30, 50, 55 percent of the time, people produced answers that lay outside those confidence intervals. Uh, and this is not unique to lay people. Here's a piece that some of you've referenced earlier in the meeting of work that, uh, that my former student Max Henry and, and Baruch Fischhoff my, uh, did years ago in which they looked at the, at, at the published values of the speed of light over time. The gray bars, however, are the recommended values, and those should include concerns about you know, systematic bias and that sort of thing. You can see in the 40s and early 50s, the recommended values didn't include the current best estimate. So, so this is, of course, a com uh, I mean, you in your opening talk uh, also pushed on this. We are systematically overconfident in all kinds of things. Uh, so next, I want to elaborate a bit on uh, the need to be quantitative. And Carl yesterday talked at length about the problems associated with using probability words to support decision making. And as he noted, such words can mean very different things in different circumstances and different things to different people in the same circumstances. And I'm going to illustrate this with a little example from some, something I did with the EPA Science Advisory Board, which I was involved with for many years and actually chaired at one stage. Uh, so the SAB was discussing words to use to describe whether a substance is or is not a likely carcinogen. And I kept pushing on them, five minutes? No. <laughs> I've been watching the clock. <laughs> um, uh, 
And the words they wanted to use were likely carcinogen and not likely carcinogen. So the minimum probability associated with the word likely spanned four orders of magnitude. The maximum probability associated with the word not likely spanned more than five orders of magnitude, and the two overlapped. So without some quantification, qualitative descriptions of uncertainty convey little, if any, useful information to decision makers. Now, the climate assessment community has actually learned this pretty well. Steve Schneider and Richard Moss, working with people like me, have produced guidance for the IPCC. I was involved in the first U.S. national climate assessment, and we produced a, a mapping of the sort shown below. But many communities have yet uh, to, uh, to get that message. Uh, okay, I want to talk a little bit about expert elicitation, because there's been a lot of talk about that. Uh, uh, expert, eliciting expert probabilities from experts requires careful preparation and execution. If you're going to do it on something that's really substantively detailed, it typically takes uh, many months to develop an appropriate protocol. It needs extensive testing. Uh, this is a manuscript that I published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science a few years ago. Uh, there's an interesting history behind this paper. I had a paper that the academy, that the PNAS had accepted an elicitation study, and the editor came back to me and said, Granger, there's a price for our uh, publishing this paper. You must write a piece like this, because we're getting all kinds of expert elicitation stuff coming in, most of which is not very well done. We want to be able to hand them a manuscript that says, here, did you follow these sorts of, this sort of advice? Now, uh, I've done a lot of these. I was going to talk about a couple of them, but I decided on the basis of what I've heard over the last couple of days to instead just talk about three things, motivational bias, uh, individual elicitation versus group consensus, and then some issues about combining experts. So here's an elicitation we did way back in 1995. It's judgments from uh, uh, 16 climate scientists about Climate sensitivity, that is the amount of warming you would see if you doubled CO2 content of the atmosphere and then held it steady for, for hundreds of years. And you'll notice we've got one respondent here who is more confident than is thermodynamically possible. And this, <laughs> this guy was widely, you know, had made wide, I mean, he's a very uh, reputable scientist, but he had made wide arguments out there in the literature uh, that uh, he didn't think CO2 was going to cause warming, and, you know, he had a strong basis for motivational bias. A couple of his colleagues called him out, so it's now widely understood who, who that expert was. Uh, this is another set of elicitations on the same quantity. The little gray bars are people who participated in the previous one. They, uh, um, uh, you notice they'd all went up. That, the, that one overconfident guy would not participate in this second one. Uh, what I want to show you, though, is these numbers across the bottom. That's the amount of probability uh, that each of these experts allocated to a, a, a number above 4.5 degrees C. And 4.5 degrees C was the upper bound that the IPCC in those days was saying was the amount of warming. So the point I'm making is that you get, we have found a number of cases where you get much tighter intervals when you put a bunch of people together in a room to do a consensus than if you do an individual elicitations. And so I think doing, if you're going to put people together, at least first do individual elicitations. These are similar results for aerosol forcing. Since uh, time's running out, I'll skip it. The last thing I wanted to talk about in this space is the notion of combining experts. If you're going to use probability distributions, and the top two here are two hypothetical experts who rather disagree, I'm going to put them into a nonlinear model, and if I run each one, then, you know, basically they're saying, oh, I've got two different views about the way the world works. But if I smush them together before I run them through that nonlinear model, I don't get to see that there are basically two different views here about the way the world works. And I mentioned in a comment yesterday uh, this lovely work by John Evans, who has laid out this taxonomy of different ways in which uh, a uh, low-dose uh, uh, carcinogen might give rise, the different mechanisms by which it might give rise to a cancer outcome. And uh, 
then he gets experts to go through and make judgments about the likelihood that each of those models of the world is in fact a correct model. Folks in the uh, seismology community have done the same sort of thing. So uh, I want to make a final word or two about the use of scenarios and whether I get the comment about integrated assessment, I leave to the uh, uh, folks running the session. Uh, scenarios are very widely used. For example, a couple of iterations back, the IPCC assessment uh, used uh, detailed SRES scenarios to make their projections. And while in principle there are ways to create scenarios that span ranges across the appropriate end space of uh, futures, that's rarely done. Folks who construct scenarios often argue that they should be viewed as predictions. They, sh they shouldn't be viewed as predictions, but basically as strategies to help people think about how things might unfold in the future. Uh, but there's a problem. You remember the availability heuristic? So, so here's a classic Kahneman-Tversky study. I'm not going to read you all of this, but this is a, a personality description of uh, of Tom W., who's a nerd. Uh, and uh, so they asked three separate groups the following questions. Group one got asked, what's the probability that Tom W. will select journalism as his major? They asked a second group, what's the probability that Tom W. will select journalism as his major, decide he doesn't like it and change uh, his majors? And the third group, same story, but decide he changes his major and switches to engineer. Okay, now the probabilities ought to go down, but they go up. Why? Because the story sounds more and more coherent. It's the availability heuristic. Here's the set of all who select journalism. Here's the set of all who select journalism but decide to change. Here's the set who select journalism but decide to change their major to engineering. And the more detail you add to a storyline, the harder it is for people to uh, remember that there could be lots of different ways to reach the same outcome. And for additional elaboration on this and some related stuff, David Keith and I have, have written a paper that talks about uh, uh, how to improve practice in this space. Uh, this is the last slide I'll show you, and I'll skip the final set of stuff. But this is a argument from in a book that uh, an author named Gregory wrote that promotes the use of scenarios. And Gregory writes, practitioners can find several advantages in using scenarios. First, they can use scenarios to enhance a person or a group's expectancies that an event will occur. This can be useful in gaining acceptance of a forecast. Second, scenarios can be used as a means to decreasing existing expectancies. Third, scenarios can produce greater commitment in the clients to taking actions described in them. That's not using scenarios to help people think through and make decisions. It's using them as a persuasion tool. All right, I'm going to talk, I'm not going to talk about integrated assessment. The slides will be up on the website. I was going to compare a very simple model with a much more complicated model that has uncertainty about model functional form as well as probability distributions on all the coefficient values uh, and uh, actually Eureka and I have been having some wonderful discussions on the side about this, but we're not going to take the time to do it. Last five bottom lines. Uncertainty is present in virtually all important decisions. We make decisions in the face of such uncertainty all the time. Our mental capabilities are limited when it comes to assessing and dealing with uncertainty. Hence, especially for important decisions, we should seek help in making such decisions, and you can get help from the sort of formal analytical strategies that I outlined. Now, I've, turns out, I've written quite a lot about some of these issues. The most recent book there is on the right, uh, and uh, with that, I'll say thanks. <clears throat> Professor Granger, thank you very much. I'm sure we would all love to, to hear more, but uh, time is pressing. I'd like to take uh, one or two questions, if I can. Please, in the middle here. Thank you, Dr. Morgan, and it's a very interesting topic. Uh, regarding the uncertainty quantification, and I think, well, just in my personal opinions, I think uh, people focus too much on the probabilistic method. But apart from this, there are 
also alternative method like the fuzzy logic and Dr. Schaffer theories and et cetera. And I would like to know your opinion about the other method regarding to the decision making and how to communicate this, uh, this method with the decision makers and why uh, this kind of non-probabilistic method is uh, less considerable by the scientist or the decision maker. Thank you. Yeah, as you say, there are a variety of other strategies, some of which, for example, invented in the computer science community who had not actually learned anything much about Bayesian probability and statistics until after they got well into the fact that they needed to treat uncertainty and things like expert systems. Uh, my own view is that in the sort of quantitative policy analysis that I've engaged in and that my uh, uh, graduate students engage in, that it's rare to find a problem which, where conventional uses of, of probability aren't sufficient to deal with issues. Uh, and so I have, for the most part, stayed away from these other methods, but I'm well aware they exist. And, uh, you know, it, it's a matter of, of making an argument that, that conventional methods of probabilistic and, of, you know, Bayesian probability are not sufficient for the problem you're addressing. Thank you. Um, one more quick question. <clears throat> Is there yeah, one? right there. Please. Thank you, really, for your interesting talk. I have a question about the expert knowledge elicitation. You showed this example with experts with very diverse views. Uh, and if I understand correctly, your uh, suggestion would be not to combine their distribution when they are really polarized. We had recently a similar example. We did an uh, Eniki. And uh, we had to combine the, the views of experts uh, that were really different, polarized. But they ended up uh, with a combined distribution with which they were pretty happy, I would say. So what is your view? OK, if they were pretty happy, then that's not a problem. <laughs> the, the, the problem arises if they have different underlying cause, cause if, they're, if they believe the underlying causal models that they are describing the models of how the world works are quite different. Then you don't want to combine them because you could easily end up producing a result which has probability across a, a portion of the outcome space, which neither group actually believes is, is very likely. And so the underlying issue of whether you ought to be combining is, first of all, I think, how different. I mean, mainly you want to figure out uh, how much might my, if the if the community of experts is not in agreement, how much, I mean, science is not a democracy. It's not, you shouldn't be voting to see uh, what the answer is. And it's entirely possible that one of these outliers is right and everybody else is wrong. You'd like to know that, the, what the consequence is if, in fact, that outlier is right. And you particularly don't want to combine them if that outlier has a completely different model of how the world works. Excellent. Thank you very much.